Hi everyone, uh, it's Peter Schuster. We're gonna be talking about safety and product liability today. So number one, why are we doing this? Well, because it's your duty. As an engineer, this is the number one priority for you in your design activities. The first rule of practice from the National Society of Professional Engineers Code of Ethics states that engineers shall hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the Republic. And in more details here, if you find as an engineer that your judgment is being overruled under circumstances that endanger life or property, then you should notify your employer or client or other such authority as may be appropriate. This is a big deal. This is one of the circumstances that you're actually authorized by your code of ethics to, uh, to go over your boss's head if necessary. Um, Safety is a big deal, and especially as a designer, you've got some responsibility to make sure your designs are safe. Designing for safety, again, biggest issue in product design. You need to make something that functions, but it needs to function safely. Our goal is to make it safe by design. Zero injury, zero profit, uh, property loss, zero damage to the environment. That's the goal. You might not achieve that, but you want to absolutely minimize these things. And then it takes some conscious focus during the design process to do that. There are basically three levels of product safety design that you might go through. Level one, the most critical, is to make the product safe by eliminating hazards. If you can do that, you've got one of the safest products out there then. So your goal should always be to try to eliminate hazards. Secondly, if you can't eliminate a hazard, you wanna reduce the risk to the user by adding guards, screens, whatever, something that stops them from encountering that hazard. And finally, if you can't do that, or perhaps in addition to that, you wanna add appropriate warnings, labels, flashing lights, sound, whatever, something to call people's attention to those hazards. So again, number one is focus on making it safe by eliminating the hazards, if at all possible. Quick example of that, the best approach, designing directly for safety. Um, over on the left here, we've got a spring set fail safe brake design. So if you lose power, it's automatically braking. Thinking about ways that you can add automatic features uh, to your systems is a great way to design in safety. On the right hand side here is a picture of the um, saw stop. Really innovative device came out a decade or two ago that um, effectively fires a, a cartridge, um, like a gun, <laughs> to um, project something into the blade to freeze the blade instantaneously when it detects the presence of a uh, a finger, a body part coming into contact with the blade. Um, pretty amazing technology there, um, and it really revolutionized that industry. A couple more examples. You can do simple things like avoiding pinch points on products, having automatic shutoffs. If uh, power gets too high, it shuts off, or if something's detected, it shuts off. Mechanical overrides. Um, I used to, when I was younger, drive a lawnmower that would continue running when it ran off by itself. Um, nowadays, you can't do that. There's a lever that you have to hold down while you're running a lawnmower. And if you release that lever, it shuts off. These are awesome safety features added that really don't add much complexity to the design. It's just a matter of someone thinking about it. Microwaves won't turn on unless that door is closed because there's a switch that detects it. These are the ways that you can eliminate the um, hazard, the user being exposed to that hazard. Now, it doesn't completely eliminate the hazard, right? You could still be holding your lawnmower switch down and tilt the thing up and stick your foot in there if you want to, but it requires more deliberate effort to do something like that. And that's what you're trying to do, make it as safe as possible. If you can't do that, adding protective features is your next layer. Um, and you see these a lot, especially in um, industrial settings. So like light screens or fuses, um, machine guards, the, if you've ever used a table saw, you've probably seen a, a feature like this on top. Um, you put cages around things that are gonna be hot or that are spinning. Again, lots of times you see it in industrial settings because the industrial settings need those. Um, the hazard can't be eliminated because it's part of the manufacturing process, but you wanna keep the people away from it. Now, the big downside of this is that these guards are add-on things, so people can remove them 
if they get annoyed by them. And that's especially the case with uh, consumers, but also with um, factory workers. If you've got personal protective equipment that you require someone to wear safety glasses, they might not wear them all the time because they can be a little annoying. Um, I know people who have removed those table saw guards because they get in the way of running a part through. So that's why the protective features are not as ideal as trying to eliminate the hazard in the first place. Third level, if you can't eliminate the hazard or put an appropriate guard, or perhaps in addition to those, you wanna add some labels. So just a warning of something is present. Like um, if you've picked up any sort of power tool, there's a warning on that. In fact, if you pick up almost any plug, you'll find a warning on that. And my question for you in terms of effectiveness is how often have you read those warning labels and paid attention to them? My guess is not very often. And that's why they're not a very effective way to keep people safe. In addition to labeling where the warnings are, you also wanna provide very good instructions. And these are important, but again, you can't guarantee that someone will follow those instructions. So you need to make it as safe as possible such that it's very hard for someone to use something improperly. Uh, a couple more examples of caution labels. Uh, you see these all over, right? We see them so often now that we probably don't pay attention to them very often. As a result, they're not as usable. So while they are still required, they actually are a little bit more about, they're on there not, in my opinion, not so much for safety as for product liability. And that's unfortunate. Um, just for fun, let's take a quick look at a few warning labels that probably show up for pro product liability, but seem pretty silly. Um, okay, you're gonna sell a knife and it has to have a warning that the blades are sharp. Okay, um, holding hot water over a person. Do not use as a battle device. This is one of my favorite ones. <laughs> the um, lightsaber there, do not use as a battle device. Uh, some other examples. CO2 alarms often have a silence feature on it. Um, to have to tell someone that the silence feature does not actually eliminate the CO problem, really? Um, or a catfish nugget containing fish. So we've got some weird things that go on in terms of labels. And most of the time, honestly, people are not reading them. It's unfortunate, but it means that as a designer, you don't want to rely on this. Um, instructions for not to put a child in the little bag at the back end of the stroller. Uh, do not wear the t-shirt while you are ironing on the iron transfer. Um, small tractor, um, danger, avoid death. Great, yeah. Uh, so while these things can help, to a large extent they don't. So again, Number one, try to eliminate that hazard. If not, try to put some sort of permanent protection in to keep the person from um, experiencing the hazard, uh, reduce their risk of being directly exposed to it. So let's look at this. What can we do to reduce safety risks? We've talked about sort of that three levels. How do you put this into play in your design process? Number one is safety should always be there as one of the criteria that you use um, to assess your design. So you're always evaluating how safe is it. If it's in there, then you're gonna pay attention to it because we always pay attention to our criteria. Design to nationally recognized standards. There are a lot of standards out there that tell us how to be as safe as possible. So design to those, don't try to avoid them. Communicate your design considerations completely and accurately throughout the process. So if you just document safety up front and then you don't do anything with it, that's not good. Make sure you're continuing that through the process, selecting appropriate materials, testing the product under all the conditions that it might actually be operated. Document your full development. That will help you to make sure you've done everything you need to do. Okay, so I'm gonna change gears a little bit here. Are we talking about safety? That's what I've been focusing on. Or are we talking about liability? And again, one of my pet peeves is all of these warning labels on things that tell people what they should have already known um, and a lot of people will never read them anyway. That's more about product liability than safety. We wanna make sure we focus on safety, but at the same time, it's good as a product designer to be aware of what product liability laws are. So a quick overview here. Product liability is really about identifying who's responsible for any damage or injury caused by a product. 
And there are kind of three categories of people who might be responsible, the manufacturer of the product, the seller of the product, or the consumer. The, the rules about product liability change over time because they are subject to court decisions. So about 100 years ago, the individual was considered to be responsible. You bought whatever you bought, and if you didn't check it out well enough ahead of time, oh well. Nowadays, it's the opposite. Uh, nowadays, if, anything, if a person is injured in any way by a product, it's generally assumed that the manufacturer has some responsibility there. So what is your responsibility when it fails to perform as expected or worst case actually does cause harm? Uh, to explain that, we need to do a quick review of legal systems. First of all, common law versus civil law systems. Common law systems, are where the court decisions become part of the law. So the law is continuously evolved by court decisions. This is called judicial pre precedence, and that's what we have in the United States and most other English-speaking countries. Civil law is used in many other countries, and that's where statutes and codes are continuously updated by the legislature, and the court simply interprets them. They don't change the law by their interpretation. Then within a, um, a common law system, we've got criminal law and civil law. Okay, so civil law is showing up twice here. I've, I've always been confused about that. But just to be clear, within the common law system, we've got criminal cases, if you will, where the government is bringing suit against a person, identifying a person is perhaps criminally liable for something. Or we have civil law, which is what we typically call lawsuits. So the government is not involved with that. They are simply mediating the decision between the uh, um, defendant and the plaintiff in a case. Product liability claims can actually show up in both criminal and civil courts. Civil is where you see most of them, but in egregious cases, they can make it into criminal courts as well. So what do we mean by product liability claim? There are kind of three levels here. First off, there's negligence. This is a judgment that someone's at fault. It may include criminal charges. So we talk about criminal negligence on behalf of a, a manufacturer. If you didn't do the design work you were supposed to do, then you might be criminally negligent. Um, and that's measured by, did you uh, apply a reasonable level of care? Strict liability is sort of a, a level beyond that. And it says that you might be liable for the damages even if you did nothing wrong. And with a strict liability claim, a manufacturer is liable even if they did everything they were supposed to do and the product still caused harm. And then finally, a uh, sort of third category is a, a little lesser, in fact, a warranty of fitness. So when you sell a product, you are effectively giving it an implied contract that it's gonna work properly. If it doesn't work properly, then you are violating that implied contract. So a warranty of fitness is sort of a contract law approach to product liability. So negligence is the main thing that you want to try to avoid in most cases. You, you can actively do everything that you should do to have a safe design, and then you will not be negligent. A strict liability, there's that, that's more up to the courts to decide if, if you bear responsibility, even if you did everything you should. In California, this is an interesting point. Defendants, so manufacturers, have to prove that the product that they produce is not defective. In 47 other states, it's actually up to the plaintiff to prove that a product is defective. So this creates a, a bit of a different situation in the courtroom where the burden of proof is. Okay, so if we're gonna talk about um, product liability cases, what are the potential defects that a product might have that um, lead to a liability case. So there's the general category of the design of the product and three sort of subcategories there. There might be a concealed danger in the product, something that a person cannot be made aware of because of some flaw in the design. Uh, so a user isn't aware that it's there, the design fails catastrophically perhaps and, and causes injury. Um, material failure is another product design related issue presumably because you've chosen the wrong material, or failure to consider misuse. Products will be used in ways that we didn't intend, and as a designer, you're still responsible for injuries that occur due to misuse within reason. Uh, another general category of product defects are in the actual manufacture of the product, or the materials used, or the packaging, or the transportation. 
as designers, we're usually less involved in that process, but if you end up working in a manufacturing area, that's going to be your main area of focus to ensure that you don't have product defects that are different, where parts are different from what they were designed to be. A third general category is with the marketing, and related to that are the warnings, labels, and instructions provided to users. So the instructions you provide have to be clear and easy to understand, appropriately placed, and last for the lifetime of the product. The claims that you make about the product must be valid claims so that someone is direct in how to use it properly. And then the last category would be disposal in the environment. And this isn't strictly a product liability issue, but it's becoming more and more important in many countries, identifying a, um, a path for the materials used in your product after its life. What happens to it then? Okay, let's come back to that negligence question because you really want to avoid ever being charged with a negligence case. Um, because again, that's where you found at fault because you didn't do what you're supposed to do. So one way that you can be charged with negligence is because the product is defectively designed. So you didn't do proper calculations, poor material choices were made, insufficient testing was done, standards were not followed. So obviously to avoid that, you do all of those things. Another option, um, design did not include proper safety devices. So look at the state of the art, look at competitive products, look at the standards that are out there and make sure you're doing the best that you can to ensure someone's safety. Third category for the designer is that you didn't see foresee possible alternative uses. Again, this is the misuse case. And the question, the legal question is, what would a reasonable person do with that product? So you cannot prevent, you cannot totally prevent egregious misuse of your product, but you can at least prevent a reasonable person from using it in an unsafe manner. And that needs to be your focus. There are a few other ones, again, slightly outside the area of the designer. Uh, the manufacturing of it, the advertising of it, and the instructions for use. Designers usually have some input to those, but we don't really control those areas. So what can you do to protect yourself from product liability claims? Well, let's look at those three that are directly related to the designer. To avoid a claim of a defectively designed product, you want to keep very good records of everything you considered in the design, including all of the calculations that you performed, all of your test results, the standards that you met, and so on. You wanna use standards whenever there are any available. You wanna use state-of-the-art evaluation or analysis techniques. Make sure you're doing the best that you can and you're documenting it. And you wanna show that your process is thorough and that it's a rational, rational reasonable process and, it, and have good documentation of that. The claim of the design did not include proper safety devices Focus, first of all, on trying to eliminate the hazards. You don't need an extra safety device if the hazard has been eliminated from contact with the person. If you can't do that, then include guards. And again, there are a lot of standards out there for that. So rely on those to the extent you can. Exceed them if possible, but certainly meet them at a minimum. And of course, add warnings. Again, it's not as effective, but it can at least provide some indication to a person that they need to be extra cautious. And then that third category did not foresee possible alternative uses. You've got to, as the designer, think about what people might do with it. Again, not every possible misuse, but anything a reasonable person might do. How might they use the product? You should try to make it as hard as possible to use that product wrong. So the easiest thing to do, the most intuitive thing to do is the way you want it used properly and try to eliminate the options to use it in improper ways. Effectively, you're trying to make it idiot-proof, idiot if you can. So that's really your goal as a designer. And now it's up to you. In your designs, you wanna think about how you can address safety. Safety, can you eliminate hazards? Um, if not, what are the appropriate safeguards to put on the design? What sort of warnings are appropriate? All right, I will see you next time.